How to analyze an income statement. Let me show you how I would get started with reviewing the income statement of a company the same way I would do it with participants in one of my finance for non-financial manager courses. Here is Walmart's income statement or profit and loss statement P&L for the fiscal years ended January 31st, 2017, 2016 and 2015. 2017 is on the left, 2015 on the right. The income statement can be found in the annual report. There is a lot of information here. We need to set priorities on which items we are going to dive into to get the most valuable use of our analysis time. My proposal would be to first dive into the revenue performance, which seems to have dropped from 2015 to 2016 and then has come back up in 2017. What are the main drivers for revenue? Next I would look into the margin performance. How have gross margin, operating margin and net income developed in relation to the fluctuations in revenue? As retail is traditionally a fairly low margin industry, every penny counts. Net income is almost $9 billion lower than operating income. Let's review what is going on in the interest and tax lines. That sounds like a good to-do list to me. Let's get started at the top. Out of the $486 billion in total revenue, $481 billion was in the net sales line, so let's review that one first. How is the net sales revenue split between Walmart's reporting segments? By far the largest segment is Walmart US, in 2017 making up 64% of, of total net sales. Second is Walmart International, 24% of the total in 2017. And third, Sam's Club at 12%. For overall net sales, there was a decline in 2016 versus 2015 and an increase in 2017 versus 2016. One of the three segments immediately jumps out at me. Can you guess which one? Walmart International, with a decline in 2016 of 9% and 2017 of 6%. I think it is important to analyze what is going on here first, as these declines are impacting the overall growth number significantly. Numbers for Walmart International on the left, narrative on the right. The Management Discussion and Analysis or MDNA section in the annual report contains many valuable comments for an analysis like we are doing. I have highlighted the key parts of the narrative that help us to get an insight to the drivers of the revenue decline in the Walmart International segment. Walmart International operates in many countries, including Mexico, Brazil and many other countries in Latin America, Canada, the United Kingdom, China, Japan and Africa. In each of these countries, transactions, selling, buying, paying salaries, operating stores, happen in local currency. For reporting purposes, all those amounts are converted to US dollars, as that is the currency that Walmart reports in to the stock market. In 2017 there was an $11 billion negative impact on revenue versus prior year from fluctuations in the currency exchange rates. And in 2016, even a negative impact of $17 billion. Currency exchange rates are an external factor, out of control by the company, and should therefore be adjusted for if you want to calculate the underlying growth. By the way, if currency exchange rates made revenue shrink when converting it to the US dollars, then it also helped shrink costs when converting from local currency to US dollars. So only the net income is truly exposed. That paints a very different picture. Currency effects more than explain the declines in revenue in Walmart International and if you analyze the revenue in this segment on a constant currency basis then you will find that net sales grew 3%. Next up is Walmart US. At 64% of total revenue it is the largest segment from Walmart. Growth of more than 3% two years in a row. What is driving that? Part of Walmart's net sales growth in 2017 was driven by physical expansion, a 1.3% year-over-year growth in retail square feet. So what should we look at as the underlying growth metric that excludes that effect? Walmart offers the term comparable sales, which is shown here quarter by quarter versus the prior year period. Sales from stores and clubs opened for the previous 12 months, including remodels, relocations and expansions as well as e-commerce sales. To finish off the revenue analysis, let's take a quick look at the membership and other income line. There is a huge increase from $3.5 billion in 2016 
to $4.6 billion in 2017. Where is that coming from? Well, the increase is fully in the other income part of the line item and it is non-recurring. A gain on sales of operations in China and Chile. So if you are planning to make any forecasts for Walmart FY18 now revenue, remember not to count on those again. We now have a clearer picture of what is driving revenue, which is the top line in the income statement. Next, let's look at the margin performance, which we can analyze at three levels. Gross margin percentage, gross margin as percentage of revenue, operating margin percentage, operating income as percentage of revenue, and return on sales percentage, net income as percentage of revenue. Let's review the percentages that Walmart provides us in the annual report. A gross profit rate of 24.9% in 2017, and operating income as a percentage of sales of 4.7% in 2017. The gross profit amount that was used to calculate the gross profit percentage is strangely enough not mentioned in the annual report. I would assume Walmart took revenue and deducted cost of sales, like I am showing here, but my calculation gets to a slightly higher percentage. Let's use the percentages that Walmart has provided and look at the trend. What do you see? Gross profit rate is rising from 24.3% in 2015 to 24.6% in 2016 to 24.9% in 2017. An increase of 30 basis points or 0.3 percentage point per year. There are many factors that contribute to these improvements. Walmart lists them in the MDNA. In 2017 versus 2016, the main driver for the improvement was improved margin in food and consumables. While gross profit is rising, operating income as a percentage of net sales has declined. The management discussion and analysis clarifies that the operating expenses have gone up primarily due to an increase in wage expense at the Walmart US and Sam's Club segments. The third and last ratio to calculate is return on sales, which is net income divided by revenue. 3.5% in 2015, 3.1% in 2016, and 2.9% in 2017. A decline following a similar pattern as operating income. Those are low net profit margins inherent in the retail industry. And that's not what makes a retailer like Walmart successful. If you want to know how Walmart, despite a low profit margin, gets to a return on assets percentage that is higher than that of a major telecom company, then please watch my video walking through an example of how to calculate and compare return on assets. Right, that's the revenue analysis and the margin analysis done. Net income is almost $9 billion lower than operating income. Let's review what is going on in the interest and tax lines. First off, interest, a charge in total of $2.3 billion, most of which is interest on debt. If we turn to the liability side of the balance sheet, we see three sections of debt. Short-term borrowings, long-term debt due within one year, and long-term debt. The sum of these three line items was $39.4 billion a year in 2017, down significantly from the $43.7 billion a year in 2016 due to strong cash flows from operations that help fund paydowns of debt. Watch my video on Walmart's cash flow statement to learn how that works. Let's take the average debt of these two balance sheet points for our calculation, $41.5 billion. If interest on debt was $2 billion, then the implied average interest rate was 4.8%. At first sight, that looks high to me. What could be driving that high percentage? Walmart's annual report lists the credit ratings it has received from major agencies. These are in the very respectable AA category for long-term debt. This means that Walmart's reputation as a borrower is very solid, which usually leads to lower interest rates. So the high 4.8% interest rate is certainly not driven by a shaky credit rep reputation. I think the answer can partially be found in this table the expected maturity date and the average interest rate for the major debt categories. As long-term debt is the main element of overall debt at Walmart, let's focus on that area. 4.7% weighted average interest rate. 
Most of the long-term debt is truly long-term in its maturity. $27.6 billion is due after fiscal year 2022. Walmart did not have any material long-term debt issuances during fiscal 2017 or 2016, so my educated guess is that most of the debt that we see on this page has been issued many years ago, when the overall interest rates were much higher. To find out whether this educated guess is correct, we would have to browse through the annual report archive of Walmart for the past 10 to 15 years and see how the debt position has developed. I consider that out of scope for this video, you are welcome to do so and comment below this video. That's 3 out of the 4 items on our to-do list done. Let's take a quick look at taxes before we wrap up. The provision for income taxes in the P&L has decreased over the past 3 years. Which sounds logical, as the income before income taxes has also dropped. A useful number to calculate is the effective tax rate, which is simply the provision for income taxes divided by the pre-tax profit. This comes out to 30.3% for 2017. Walmart provides more information about the effective tax rates in the, in the annual report. The US statutory tax rate is 35% and most of Walmart's income is taxed at that rate, given the relative size of the Walmart US in overall results. The overall effective tax rate for the company is lower than the 35% statutory rate, primarily due to non-US income being taxed at lower local country rates. That completes our analysis. We have looked into the major drivers of revenue growth, analyzed the trends in margin rates, and explained the gap between operating income and net income, by looking at, into interest and taxes. If you want to learn more about Walmart's financial statements, I would encourage you to read the annual report and listen to the earnings releases. Please comment below, as I would love to hear what you think. I hope you enjoyed this video on how to perform a high-level income statement analysis. I have many more videos available that can help you as a non-finance manager to understand the basics of how financial statements work. On this end screen, there are a few suggestions of videos you can watch next. Please subscribe to the Finance Storyteller channel, so you can stay up to date on my latest videos. Thank you!